Yeah, hello. So we are coming from Collaborative Research Center, which is located in Berlin and which, which combines humanities and also data sciences. And we are presenting now only one project of this Collaborative Research Center, and this is concerned with um, knowledge and text transfer in the context of Aristotelian manuscripts and the paratexts such as commentaries, Aristotelian commentaries. Particularly, we are interested in the Aristotelian work, the Interpretation, and this work is the ancient Greek work, non-religious work, uh, which has survived in, with the most copies. So we have approximately 150 copies. So one of these problems we have is um, that we do not know where the manuscripts ori were originally copied. No? And many scholars, since it is one of the most interesting works concerning text and knowledge transmission from antiquity, scholars have been interested in this work over centuries, but they haven't solved the question in which knowledge was spread over the Greek speaking part of Europe and also the further East and um, in the Byzantine em um, Empire, for example. And um, because there had been some problems, and one problem is that they, it was said that this whole transmission had been a lot too complex, and there was a high number of contaminations. Contaminations means that the copy hasn't been copied only from one manuscript, but from more manuscripts. And so the, neg the result was always negative. So everybody said this cannot be resolved within the life of one researcher. It could be resolved, but not in this short time of one human life. So um, we now found some perspectives, particularly the perspective that if you, for example, larger or enlarge your data, you could also come to a solution. And this means that you have to take into account also paratext, not only the text itself and the copies. And uh, this is not possible to do it in an analogical way, but we built or we try to build um, digital infrastructure, as we can see and also a kind of bottom-up infrastructure that Dana will present. For example, we, we try it via an, an automatic and semi-automatic layout analysis and also via annotation tools that we created and which can be then in the second step also exploited by the, our data scientists with different tools that Dana will now explain in the second part of the talk. But the first uh, perspective that I will give for, the, for finishing this small perspective as introduction is, that now with this digital infrastructure, we gain some great opportunities. For example, um, we can proceed greatly because we have a digital repository where we put in all the digitized manuscripts, uh, copies that we organized or bought. Um, we were funded by the German Research Foundation. Um, then we have now the opportunity via this repository to work together on a digital, in a kind of digital room with scholars from wherever who are interested in this research question. And our uh, results and our data won't be lost at the end of a project. So it will be sustainable also for future generations or for interested scholars who would like to work on it one day. So and now I hand it over to Dana. Thanks a lot for, for this description and I will now pitch in with a little, with a view which is a little more abstract. Um, okay, so what did we do? We put basically all the images of the manuscript into a digital repository. We added quite comprehensive uh, metadata to that and we created tools as set for, for annotation and also for exploitation of, of the data to find these relations and transfer that Michael was talking about. Um, and this is maybe in connection to the talk we had before. So this is uh, not only interesting from a humanities point of view, but also for the computer science. Um, we are in the situation that we can develop methods and directly apply them to a real life and uh, by this also quite heterogeneous data set. And we are always trying, um, so by using standards wherever possible, on, on the model level, on the interface level, we're always trying to keep the balance between the specific task that, that this was described and uh, some more generic infrastructure, which is usable for further projects. And why is this part especially important to us? So 
Michael has already teased towards this collaboration center, this uh, collaborative research center. So I will tell you a little story for that. So once upon a time, there was this collaborative research center. Um, and they um, already had a very, very high level of interdisciplinary collaboration. And they worked happily together for a couple of years, but then they were more or less told to add another project to take care of their research data. So what now? Um, indeed, they did add such a project and this became our task to fill in this additional piece called INF project into this already well-oiled machine of the CRC. Um, and for this, we basically had two options, either providing a rather generic data solution for all the projects, or on the other hand, try to explore joint research with a group of uh, traditionally working scientists. Um, you may imagine we opted for the latter without ignoring the former. Um, and we were in the extremely lucky position that all these scholars, they were already used to um, try to explain their content to colleagues from other fields. So we found four of these projects. Uh, they, they were brave enough to go on this adventure with us. Um, and we are quite proud to report actually that uh, A, no scientist was harmed in this process at least not seriously, um, and B, they did uh, really amazing work and by that dragged more projects into our reach. To be a little more honest at that, uh, these years were not as fluffy as they may sound. So also, we also had some obstacles and I will show you some examples which uh, never happened in exactly this way or any similar one. So what uh, how did it work out? In the beginning, we had scientists um, which were a bit scared that they could not fulfill requirements, so to say. And in this case, it worked really, really well to start with a small data set, show them prototypes with limited functionality very, very early in the process, and then iteratively extend on both sides. Um, the other extreme was uh, that data can be promised, but was never collected. Um, so joint research and especially this data creation part um, tends to, to get extremely underestimated. And especially these small projects, they really, they can't do it just on top of their regular work, workload. It's not possible. Um, then once, once it started, uh, it became very, very important to us to define a, a place to, to meet, not, not in person, but uh, in the range of how digital things are. So um, one example would be Excel tables. Uh, they tend to haunt data scientists in their dreams, but they're also quite, quite low level and, and can be used more or less easily. And one ex advantage for that is um, they can be transformed more or less automatically, sometimes painfully, but they can be transformed. If you put a sticky note on a piece of paper, there is no way of automatically process that. Um, yeah, and this is already uh, my last point. So uh, the initial effort of, of this joint research, um, this can be scary as hell, to be honest. Um, and luckily Michael is there, so I can praise him a little. Uh, he basically worked for months um, without complaining, um, but still in, in pure trust of us telling him that this will work out. Um, and only now we are in a position that, that the other projects, they also see the possible benefits and they are now eagerly waiting in line to, to jump on our train, so to say. Um, and this last part, that's uh, basically our take home message. Um, 
data scientists can develop the most sophisticated infrastructure, there is no way it will be used unless you have really cool use cases and enthusiastic researchers, which will spark interest in their colleagues. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now reached the end of the first part of our workshop. I just want to ask if there are any clarification questions. That if, if I'm not mistaken, you said you'll, you have uh, 150 manuscripts. And later in the slides, I saw that uh, you had uh, about 100, 100 plus uh, scholarly descriptions of manuscripts. And does it mean that you uh, do not have uh, complete uh, paleographic and, and, and uh, uh, codicological description uh, for all the manuscripts you work with? And uh, the second question is, um, I saw uh, in the slides that some of the uh, uh, fragments of the patches were in black and white or in grayscale, and some were in color. Does it mean that you work um, in some cases with uh, uh, pictures, uh, with black white pictures, and sometimes with uh, um, with uh, uh, color uh, digital pictures? Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Yeah, you're, you're surely right. Um, the, uh, I start with the second question because it's a little bit easier to answer probably. We are, we are working with black and white because of, um, it's a question of money at the end because if you order digitized copies in colored, it costs a lot and it's a lot um, easier to go into an archive where you find a microfiche microfilm and you can digitize it with, for example, we have the Aristotle archive, uh, which exists also in Berlin. And um, there you have um, thousand Aristotelian manuscripts in uh, micro uh, films. And so we can digitize it. We have the technique and we can use it. And for the most important ones, we can order them, but they, for example, if we order one in the Vatican library, one page costs hundred euros. So if you're needing hundred pages or more, you can, you know, how much it costs and we do not have the money to order them all in, in colored copies. But nevertheless, we, <clears throat> we are um, getting all the 150s um, in a digitized way. That is the first one. And the second question co uh, concerning the um, manuscript, um, uh, manuscripts and the metadata and the information, yeah, um, we are still, uh, it's work in progress and we have catalogs, but the catalogs are often very old. So dating back to the 19th century and with all our um, paleographical and codicological competence, we are now f have gone on, we are, you know, we are now a um, little bit further than in the 19th century. So that means that we are doing the um, manuscripts like, um, trying to figure out when <clears throat> we have to date a manuscript and so on. We do it on our own very often. And we, uh, this means that we are not just taking the knowledge from the catalogs of the 19th century, but we are trying to, um, to, yeah, to adjust them to um, the knowledge of nowadays a little bit. So that means we have now, by, we are between 100 and 120 at the moment. And we will be next year, hopefully, we will have finished all the 150. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.